Ruth Severe. Ruth Severe was the third child of Bonnie Kay and John Severe. She was born in 1783. Take this into account. Her parents were married in August of 1780. By 1783, they had three kids. Now that was on top of the 10 that he had given with, had with Sarah. Now I can't tell you about Ruth's story without at least starting off about John Severe. John Severe in his lifetime ran, wore many, many hats. He was a son, a father, a husband. He was a grandfather. He was a state builder, a well-seasoned traveler. He was a surveyor. But the biggest hat that he won, wore, I'm sorry, was that of Indian fighter. He was at the head of the militia. They were victorious 35 battles. Now, after each battle, they would round up the captives and eventually they would march him off to the stockade near Elizabethan, which was not there then. One time after the battle, he had rounded up nearly a hundred hostages. And he noticed as John Sevier was walking around looking at him, and he noticed that one end held all the fierce warriors and the braves that they had captured. But at the other end, there was a totally different group. There were about 30 of them, they were poor, they were dirty, they were looked like they were starving. The clothes they had on were rags. And John Severe, as much of an Indian fighter was, had compassion. So what do you do with 30 starving Indians? You take them home, of course. And so that's exactly what he did. He took them home. Now, Bonnie Kate was a very happy person, always happy to see anybody. Now, the way the frontier was set up, you didn't see anybody but your family from sometimes the weeks on end, unless, of course, you were called into the fort for an Indian attack. So anytime you saw a new face, you were always happy to have fresh news, fresh conversation. Even as much as you loved your family, you wanted fresh people once in a while. So John Sevier went into the house that day after he marched all the Indians to his house, and he said to her, Honey, I brought home company for lunch. Could you feed them? Bonnie Kate was really happy to see families, anybody. So she ran out the door, and there in the yard stood 30 of the most dejected Indians she had ever laid eyes on. They were starving. Their clothes were in rags. They were dirty, and they were dejected. So, but Bonnie Kate was too much of a lady to say she was shot. She jumped into action. She had all of her ladies set up bath water, and she began to give them baths. They were very reluctant to take baths, but she gave, made sure that they got baths. She sent her boys out to all the neighboring colonies and asked them, could you send us warm, dry clothing? And the boys came back with warm, dry clothing. Bonnie Clates had food made out for them. They ate, they were bathed, and they wore clean clothing, and they were happy, and they were so full after not eating for weeks on end, that they all fell asleep immediately. Now, after a while, 20 of them Indians went home, but 10 of them decided they were going to stay because they, there were lots of little kids running around calling Bonnie Kate Mama. So the Indians started calling her Mama. And they liked Mama's cooking, and they liked Mama's sweetness, and they really liked Mama a whole lot. So they wanted to live by Mama, so they went out into the woods and they built little hogans for them to live in. Now the severe children and the Indian children, children see no race difference. They begin to play together each day. The children would go to Plum Creek and they would play all day long. Now, Ruth is the third one. They couldn't quite get Ruth out of her mind, but they called her Chucky because Rolla Chucky Jack was Jack, John Severe's name. They called her Chucky's Rutha. They couldn't get out Ruth, but they could call her Rufa. So they started calling the, the children. She was teaching them how to speak English. The Cherokee children were teaching her how to speak Cherokee. And they played all day long, as long as weather was good to game. One day, the girls were all playing in the water when the little girl says something about walking thunder. Walking thunder? What in the world is that? Ruth said. Well, it turns out that the village 
just the homes that they had built, had a visitor last night. And they told of a great group of men who were headed to the valley to burn houses, steal the livestock, kill the fruit. They were Tories, and they were half Indians, half whites. They were highway men. They were murderers. They just wanted to come into the valley, burn and kill, because they had lost the war, the British were they, and they were going to deport them as soon as they caught them. Matter of fact, the United States government deported 80,000 English subjects out of this country. So Mexicans being deported, it was not the first time. So she said, no, you had company last night. What did the company say? She said, it was a great group of men who were coming into the valley and they wanted to kill people. And I knew that this was a dire situation. Somebody she had to tell, so she ran home as fast as she could run. When she got there, there was nobody there. And there wasn't even a horse, but one horse was out in the pasture. They had put him out because he was old, and they just wanted him to live out of his golden years in the pasture. But that's the only horse she had. That was the only horse she had. Ruth jumped on the horse, led him out of the trail, and headed off to the furthest homestead that she could go. There she found an able-bodied 16-year-old boy who she sent him out to the next homestead. Then Ruth rode to the fort, called to the men up on the parapet. Men are coming, men are coming. They're going to do no good. So they said, come in, Ruth, come in, Ruth. She said, no, I've got to save my neighbors. So the fort sent out a fast run into Jonesboro. That's where the militia was at that day, along with John Sevier. And Ruth rode back across the valley. She would not go into the fort to save the next homestead. There she found another Amy Ballard rider, and she sent them on. And finally, one by one, the folks were gathered into the fort. The militia was met halfway back from Jonesboro by the fast runner, and they galloped with all speed to the head of the valley, and there they captured the, the 200 rebels who were going to burn, kill, loot, and sell, and probably rape as well. That was Ruth saved the day by doing that, her ride. Now, Ruth had an exciting life after that. At the age of 14, she met and married Richard Chautante Sparks. Chautante was his Indian name. He had been captured by the Shawnee Indians when he was four years old. And he was held captive for 12 years. But he did not suffer because he was taken into the family of Blackfish, Chief Blackfish who also adopted the famous Tecumseh. So they were raised as chief sons, along with Chief Blackfish's son. They had also captured another little boy. There were three all about the same age, and they were raised as honored chief sons. Now, constantly the Shawnee and the British were fighting battles. And after one particular battle, the British said that he had to give him back to, the, to, America, to his parents. So they took him back to western Pennsylvania where he had been captured. When he saw his mother, his mother fell down and started weeping loud tears. And she, Chautante was scared because the only time he had ever seen an Indian woman cry is when the Shawnee would burn a Cherokee at the stake. Then they would cry loud tears and weeping. They never wept for their own children that they lost. They never wept for their husbands or their family, but they wept for the Cherokee hostages that were being burnt. So she, at 14, met this Chauti, married him. She was his secretary. Once he joined the militia, he learned how to be civilized. He learned how to speak English but he never learned to read or write English. So Ruth went with him and she was his secretary. In the War of 1812, Richard was made a full colonel and was given his own secretary so Ruth could go home and become a mother. She became a mother to Mary Polly and Elizabeth. In 1815, Chante had a major stroke and he died. In 1815, also John Severe died. So that was a year that was really hard on Ruth. P. 
People on the frontier had no time for grieving. So the very next year, 2016, Ruth remarried. This time she married Donald Devertner, and they had a son named Ezekiel. In May of 1824, Ruth traveled to Maysville, Kentucky to visit some family there. And she became seriously ill and she died. And she's buried up in East Tennessee. East Kentucky Cemetery, I'm sorry. Now, I, John Sevier was a very charismatic man. Anybody who met him fell in love with him. Men really liked him. He was really a serious man. And he could build two states, the state of Franklin, the state of Tennessee. I think that's about all I have right now. I can open to questions, and I'm sorry that I've did a little hesitant. Uh, I have a couple of comments that we sort of talked about. Okay. You talked about two of the women that were connected with John Sevier's life, uh, his daughter, Ruth, or Rutha, mm -hmm. and also his wife, Catherine, uh, sometimes called Bonnie Kate, right? Now, on our YouTube channel for the Smoky Mountain Historical Society, there is a video of somebody you used to work with named Bob Jones, mm -hmm. and we talked about John Sevier. And, um, one of the things that he told about was the uh, exciting rescue of Bonnie Kate at the fort, Fort Watauga. And uh, he had a certain take on it. Um, do you have any other details or information about that rescue? Was it real? It was a true story. Uh, Bonnie Kate had gone out of the fort to milk her cow. The cow had wandered clear down to the river. Now there were other people outside of the fort gates, but they were within reach. Now Bonnie Kate was leading her cow back when she heard a noise behind her. She turned around and out of the woods comes a raging party of Indians. They want to attack the fort and kill as many white people as they can. Bonnie Kate's got that cow and she's leading it back. We didn't keep the cows and the horses inside the fort because nobody wanted to step in it or smell it, what they do after they eat. So they kept outside of the fort. So every morning, Bonnie Kay's one chore was to go out and get the milk cow. Milk cows were extremely rare back then. So if you had a milk cow, you know, you could get butter, you could make cheese, all kinds of things you could make with milk cow. And very, very valuable. She wanted to save her cow. She tried pulling on it, she tried kicking it, she tried slapping it. That cow was not going to hurry no matter what. So she finally had to abandon her cows. By this time, there's a whole raiding party running behind her trying to catch her. Well, the people closest to the fort saw the Indians they run in, and the gates were shut against Bonnie Kate. Being the convoy that she was, she jumped on the sides of the gates and started climbing up. Where they were made of trees, of course, and there were knobs where the foot and she put her feet on each knot, and she was climbing up. She got up, so she reached up her hand to a man, she couldn't see who, up her hand, and the hand grabbed her, picked her literally up, throw her over the top of the fort, right into the middle on the ground. Now, all the people at the fort came running up, and they were congratulating because she's alive, and John Sevier casually walks up and said, but that was a mighty good foot race that you just run in one there, my dear. And from then on, everybody said, Bonnie, that means beautiful. And she was quite beautiful. So from then on, nobody called her Catherine anymore. She was Bonnie Kate from then on. Now I want to talk about Sarah, his first wife. Okay, John Sevier married at the age of 16 to 15-year-old Sarah Hawkins. They had 10 children. Sarah was one of the people that stayed out of the spotlight but firmly on John Sevier's side. Anything he wanted to do. She was so trustworthy that when he left the fort, he even left her in charge of the fort several times. So she was really a good lady. She died after her 10th child. This is what happened. She had just given birth to her 10th child. John Sevier was away, and just as her and the children were at home, the nine other children. And they were standing around the bed admiring the new baby. 
when one of the cache looked out the door and saw a raiding party of Indians coming towards their house. They got Sarah up, handed her that new baby, they headed out the front door, running through the woods to the fort. Most of them were barefoot, so I'm hardly dressed. And that newborn baby was hardly even wrapped in a blanket. They ran and they ran and they ran and they ran to the fort. People at the gates saw them running and opened up the gates. And they ran inside and Sarah found out and she died. Now, men did not raise children at all. So they had to be farmed out. But he didn't want to farm out his children. So he thought, I got to get married and I got to get married quick. Now, he had rescued Bonnie Kate and she was very, very beautiful. And she was available and she was willing. And finally, she was at her house and she saw John coming and she ran out to meet him and she said, what took you so long to get here? <laughs> so she was waiting for him to come. So they were married. She gave him eight more children. Sarah was an extremely beautiful woman. But Bonnie Kate had her top teeth. Day. She was beautiful. While Sarah was blonde and little, Bonnie Kate was dark and tall. So two different types of women, but both of them very, very good. Now, John Sevier is called the father of Tennessee. And if there is a father, there must be a mother. And that mother is Sarah Hawkins Sevier. Does anybody have any other questions that I can answer? Yes, dear. How old was Bonnie Kate when she ran and he grabbed 34 her? years old. She died at 34. No, I'm sorry. I said wrong. Uh, Sarah. When he grabbed her at four. Oh, she was only 22. Okay. Yeah. So she was a woman. <coughs> yes, and girls back then got married at the age of 13. So why was it, she still available if she was beautiful and 22? Because she had never found a man that she wanted. And her parents said, I, she said her, to her parents, I will marry for my heart only. And she had never yet met a man that she wanted to marry. When she met John Sevier, she gave him his, her, his heart, but he was still married to Sarah. So four years later, Sarah died, and Bonnie Kate stepped up. She sounds like a strong-willed woman, but she's very intelligent. And she was. She was uh, very likable. Everybody loved her, but Sarah was quiet and everybody loved her. I kind of think I'm on Sarah's side myself. Uh, I think she's the, the wife. She must be the mother if John is the father of the agency. But she never got to see her husband become governor or go to the House of Representatives or go to Congress. Money Kate did all of that. Maybe she gave him a good foundation. And yes, she did. Uh, she sold all of the clothes. Sarah did. Bonnie Kate, when she married John, sat down and sewed an outfit for each of his sons to go off to war in. So she gave, Sarah gave five of her sons. She's the first five star mother in Tennessee. Any other questions? Can you, uh, do you know any of the details of John Sevier's early life? His father was a storekeeper, and John was raised up keeping the store along with his father. He was also a horse trader. So he traded horses and run the store at the same time. Now, when he and Sarah married, they opened a store of their own somewhere else. Now he was also a surveyor and so he bought some land and he went into the land and he set off, he surveyed off sections of land. Businesses over here, houses over here, and a nice downtown. They began to sell lots through it. That became thriving New Market, Virginia that is still there today and it was all started by John Sevier. Then he was traveling all the time. He was always a curious person. He wanted to know what was around that next bend in the road. And he was on his horse all the time. Sometimes he would be gone for weeks. And Sarah, and later on, Bonnie Kate, 
would maintain. They knew he was coming back at a certain time or, or not a certain time. They knew he would come back. And so, like I said, he left Sarah in charge of the fort several times while he went off and did several businesses. Was he ever, in the early earlier days, was he ever with Dan Boone and Wilderness Road or the early uh, um, Not that I'm aware area. of. I'm yeah. trying to say that. There's no proof that him and George Washington were ever met either, but George Washington influenced John Severe's idea to become a surveyor. Yes. Yeah, because he was surveyor. So that's what he did in his younger life. Worked in a store, traded horses, and started property, became a husband, became a father. They had seven children before they moved to the photography. Jane, uh, you also pretty active for 20 some years at 21, Marble Springs. 21 years. Now tell us about some of that work. I was a reenactor at Marble Springs. Due to the rheumatoid arthritis, he couldn't walk on the grounds anymore, so I had to give it up after 21 years. But after, I did play Bunny Kate at the tavern. I played the tavern keeper. I was at the kitchen. I did whatever was needed that day. Whoever was, what station needed meant, I would man it. The only one I wasn't very good at was the loop house. Uh, I never did learn about the flax and the carding, the cotton and stuff like that, but everything else I did. I played Mrs. Bonnie Kay at the East Tennessee Fair History Fair five years in a row, along with Lynn Fox, a man who says, still portrays John Severe to this day. Now, we have a new one at, at Marble Springs. His name was Bob Jones. Lee Lou talked about interviewing him. I also asked him about what is the connection between John Sevier and Sevier County. And one of his responses was the Battle of Boyd's Creek. Do you have anything to say about it? Sevier County was in the state of Franklin, so he was there. It said on the internet <clears throat> that while John Sevier was the governor of the short-lived Franklin State, state of Franklin, that three counties were named or brought into being, I don't know what the term is. One was Blunt County, which I assume was named after the, the Blunt. Blunt. Yeah. Blunt. Cock County, I don't know who it was named after. John, Cock County. Cock County. William Cock. William Cock. And the third one was Sevier County, named after John. So that may have been they just the divided who? That's what was in the state of Franklin. Mm -hmm. Now, they wanted Franklin to succeed as a state, and that's why they named it Franklin. They hoped that the Ben Franklin would give them support and would become a state. But they said, no, you are on North Carolina territory. And so Franklin can't become a state. Ben Franklin just distanced himself from the he and had nothing to do with it. And so it failed, and the registration would not be left and become a state. So it started all over again, picked up the entity and name to Nassie, and turned it to Tennessee. The Battle of Woods Creek was how long after they had, uh, Denver Mountain men had done. Uh, they Kings Mountain. They had missed. They were just on their way back. They had they were on their way back from Kings, the victory at Kings Mountain, that big victory at Kings Mountain, and they heard the dragon canoe was raiding up and down Boys Creek, killing and burning, and stealing the livestock, and so the militia rode straight to them and went into battle with them. They were not able to capture Dragon Canoe. But they did capture the rest of the Indians. The dragon canoe got away. He was the leader of the group. Now, John Sevier, I want to tell you about how John Sevier died. President Madison asked John Sevier to go to Alabama to settle a treaty with the Creek Indians. The Creek Indians were going to sign this treaty, and they were going to cede half of their property to the United States. And they were going to keep half of it. But it needed to be surveyed out. So, John. John Sevier was sent by President Madison. At the time, Alabama was very, very swampy. Water was everywhere. And where water is, mosquitoes breed. 
and when mosquitoes breed, they pass on yellow fever. John Sevier celebrated his 70th birthday on September the 23rd, and he died the next day of yellow fever on September the 24th, one day after his 70th birthday. Any other questions? You mentioned Mary Polly. Usually the name was not Mary Polly on the birth certificate. How did that everybody go Mary Polly? Because so many times I see that. People shut short of names back then. I have an aunt who was named Sarah Sally Ann Smith. And she married a gold, which is John Henry Gold was John Sevier's mother. She married into the Gold family. So John Sevier are and I are connected to family eight generations back. And I thought that was really really I didn't find this out until the 2021 after I was trying to finally had to go couldn't go back and I was digging deep into the history and trying to find more and more information and I found that I'm actually related to John Sevier and I'm thrilled about it too. Thank you for coming. Let's give Jane a big hand.